The Holy Gospel for this second Sunday of Lent is from the Gospel of John, the third chapter. This will sound familiar to many of you. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown up? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Don't be astonished that I say to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right. I'd like to invite the children to join me up here for the children's message. We're going to stand around this today. Well, let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for this remarkable, incredible, unimaginable gift that you give us to be born of your spirit, to become part of your family, to become part of this family, to become part of your people on earth. Help us to understand and appreciate the gift, but also not to hold it tightly to ourselves and withhold it from others. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, one of the things we're going to be doing this Lent is trying to figure out on Sunday mornings, what is the path, the trajectory that led from Jesus being, you know, a healer and a beloved person, right, to all of a sudden everyone turns on him and he ends up being crucified. And so I want to tell you just as a preview to some of that, that the seeds in John of Jesus' crucifixion are set in John 2, the beginning seeds, because Jesus in John goes to the temple to worship and sees there the money changers and the people who are selling the items needed for sacrifice to God. And they're, they're making change from people's kind of um, rural coinage or whatever they used to the Roman Empire so that they could make an offering in the temple. And the rates of exchange were so high so that the temple could make money off of those, right? And, 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 the, um, and the animals needed for sacrifice were sold at a usurious rate so that people, uh, the temple would make money. And Jesus saw this and and that's different than what we do when we sell coffee. You know, we're not selling things at a usurious rate for the good of ourselves. So it's okay, you can keep buying your coffee and tea and chocolate and whatever else there is out there, it's all right. Um, every time this text comes up, somebody says, whoa, what does that mean about what we do? Well, what we do is different. That's what we say. So... <laughs> um, but, but Jesus took and made a whip and he drove out those money changers and the people selling all of the um, animals and stuff and said, you've, you've turned my father's house of prayer into a den of thieves. 
And in, with that action, he made an enemy of the leaders of the temple and the Pharisees and the Sadducees because he took away their profit that they were making from the poor and they were exploiting those who came to make offerings at the temple. And so we come to John 3 and we have Nicodemus who now comes to Jesus by night because he's a Pharisee. And we don't really know why he came. I can think of a couple reasons. He didn't want the other Pharisees to know. He was coming to ask Jesus questions maybe. Maybe he was becoming a disciple. Certainly the Gospels indicate that that may have been the case, at least a secret disciple of Jesus because he with Joseph of Arimathea at the end of Jesus' life provided for his burial. Um, maybe it's that the questions were much more serious at night. And he asks Jesus, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? The questions are bigger. And after Easter, we're going to explore the questions that keep us up at night. What do you worry about when you're laying in bed? We're going to talk about some of those things. But for today, I want to talk about this remarkable thing that Jesus says. What I just said to the children, Jesus said that we have to be born of the Spirit, of water and the Spirit. That's a second birth. If we were fundamentalists, we'd talk about it as, um, what do we, my brain just went blank on, on what it's called. Well, you, we call it being saved, Pe Pentecostal, huh? Regeneration and born again, thank you. That was the word I was looking for, I appreciate it, or the words. So, but that's what Jesus says. We can't actually re-enter our mothers, of course, but the Holy Spirit comes into us. And we believe that happens in baptism. So I thought it might be a good idea to tell you today some of the things we tell families when they come for baptism class so that you know what we believe and what we say about baptism. First, we say that it's a sacrament. A sacrament is where the promise and word of God meet something we can touch and see and feel. And they bring about an action that God promises. And the action that God promises in baptism is that we will have eternal life. And that comes to us in the, in the spirit entering us and the water being washed over us. This is an incredible gift. It promises us forgiveness. We know that God loves us. God chooses us. I'm going to say more about that. This is, um, these, you, you can't probably read underneath, but I'll, I'm going to go through them quickly. The, this is from the, a book that we give all the families that have a child who's um, being baptized. This is some of the images that we talk about for baptism. In the upper left-hand corner, it says we're dying with Christ and rising with Christ, that we, in wa the waters of baptism, we die to our old life, our life before Christ. In the, in the long version of the baptismal liturgy, we say, we are born children of a fallen humanity. In the waters of baptism, we are reborn children of God and inheritors of eternal life that we die and are reborn. A better symbol for that is what the Orthodox do when they baptize a baby. They bring the baby in in um, street clothes and then they take off the clothes and they immerse the baby in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit all the way under the water as though they were dying, not drowning, but as though they were being buried you know, symbolically. And then they take the baby out, dry it, dry it off, and put on the garments, the new baptismal garments, so they don't wear their pretty white robes and stuff till after the baptism, as a sign that they've entered this new life in Christ. And then if you look on the far upper right, it says, new birth, change, uh, a change so complete that it's like being born anew. We just read that in John 3. In the middle, we have the symbol or the sign of it as a cleansing bath, that our sins are washed away in the waters of baptism. Peter said that, and uh, Titus, Titus said it too in the New Testament, that our sins are washed away in the waters of baptism. Does that mean we don't sin? No, of course it doesn't mean we don't sin. Does that mean that we don't have to pay the consequences of some of our sins? My great niece Maddie, 
and the other two kids went to the park this week, and Maddie decided she was going to do a concert in the park, singing. And she had a screaming fit. She has these meltdowns when her mom and dad wouldn't make the other two kids sit and listen to her concert. <laughs> she had to pay the consequences of that sin, right? But her sins are forgiven. God washes that away. And her parents forgive her. But you have to also learn not to do stuff like that, right? So we're cleansed. And then the bottom left says we're sealed by the Holy Spirit. We say that in baptism. We make the sign of the cross on a baby and we say, child of God, you are sealed by the Holy Spirit. And that's language that Paul uses that's legal language. If someone is adopted, when that adoption happens, the court puts its seal on that document and says this is for real and forever. And that's what happens to us in baptism. God seals us, marks us for real and forever. And then in the right hand, it's a transfer from old ownership to a new ownership. An old realm to a new realm. We're, we're made a new creation. Paul said in, um, in Christ, we are a new creation. Everything old has passed away and behold, everything has become new. That happens to us in baptism. I think it's lovely that we baptize babies. And the reason that we baptize babies, or one of them, is that we believe that baptism, this conferring of God's spirit and God's kingdom on us, is 100% God's work. God does it. And what better way to prove that than to have it happen to a baby who can't say, okay, I'm in. Right? God says, yes, you, without the baby saying anything back. Then let's go to the next slide. Oh, you, we're at the next slide. We're being clothed in a new robe, like I said about the Orthodox. Paul talks about this as um, taking on the new robes of salvation, um, the clean white garments of the body of Christ. It's, um, it, Noah's Ark is a symbol of uh, baptism, or we look at it as a symbol of baptism because it, it is a crossing over the waters from what was the old sinful world to what will be the new world that God has created. And then in the middle, it brings the presence of the Holy Spirit, so it brings enlightenment. The Holy Spirit lives in us, and so we come to understand that the Spirit is growing us and is growing in us and teaching us the way of Christ. And then I talked under seal, it's like adoption into a new family, that we become part of the family of God. And finally, the example Jesus used in John 15 is that it's like Jesus is a vine, and we are being grafted onto the vine to create a new kind of grape. Each of us is a new kind of fruit. So if anybody asks you what you are, you can say fruity. Yeah, maybe not. Um, so those are ways that we talk about baptism. Those are ways that we think about baptism to think about how significant this passage is. It isn't a minor thing at all. Now, one of the dangers that comes with us saying, oh, God chose me. I am God's child is that we will read John 3.16 in this way. God so loved the world that he sent his son so that whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have eternal life, which means that other people will perish, right? And it can lead to a kind of triumphalism to say, God chose me and not you, right? It can lead us to think of ourselves as somehow uniquely special in the world, which we each are as God's creation. But we also recognize that every person is uniquely God's beloved creation. And so we have to go quickly to John 7, uh, 3, 17. God didn't send his son to condemn the world. Isn't it, do you experience that you, when I was a kid especially, I loved being able to tell who was going to heaven and who was going to hell. And I was sure I knew. And I, and I could have told you. Some of you w would have been in, but not all of you. <laughs> but I'm not naming names, Emma. No. <laughs> but what John 
317 tells us is that's not what this is about. This isn't about having insiders and outsiders. It's about understanding what God has done in me and for me. What God has changed in me. On the days when you have the most trouble with yourself, I encourage you to do what I had the children do and mark your forehead with the cross and say, I am God's beloved child. If you want to do that as you come up for communion today and say that in your head, be my guest. It's entirely appropriate to mark yourself with water and a cross when you come up for communion anytime to remind yourself of this incredible love, of this fact that God has remade you, reshaped you to be in the image of Christ, that the Spirit of God lives in you. But God does that first for our own sake, so that we are followers of Jesus, we love Jesus, but then our fruit is to grow out from that, right? Grapes don't grow on the vine to make the vine happy. Grapes grow on the vine to make the vintner happy. And, and that's what we are to do with this wonderful news of what God has done for us, this incredible gift, this new life. We're to share it with the world, not to judge the world, not to feel superior to the world, not to look at the people around us and try and figure out if they're as close to God as I am, or if they're closer, not so that we can worry about that, but so that we can go out and turn outward with that love and mercy of Christ and love our neighbor. This means that we are challenged to see our neighbor, and remember our neighbor is not only the person who's most like us, but the person who's least like us. We are challenged to see our neighbor as, as beloved of God, as we understand ourselves to be. God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. And God sends you with that love of Christ into the world to change your world by living out what God has already done in you. So that's what I'd like you to do this week. I'd like you to think about um, if you have self-esteem issues, I'd like you to just spend the week pondering and meditating on the depth of God's love for you, on how much God loves you. You are God's child. Nothing can ever change that. If you kind of get that already, then I'd like you to take the next step and look out at the world and look at who you can ask God to help you love to help you care for, to help you pray for. Um, I, I read a great theologian whose name I now cannot remember, but I think it was Yaroslav Pelikan, who wrote an article co uh, called, Does, Is It God's Intention to Save Everybody? And he said, I don't know that, he said, I, I don't know whether everyone will be saved, you know, in the end, whether everyone will go to heaven. But he said, what I do know is, that that's what God's heart would like. God's heart is for the world. God's heart is forgiveness and mercy. Now that's not to say that evil people don't deserve justice, right? I mean, there's, remember, there's that justice piece that also comes with mercy. But God calls us to love the world. And so look at yourself or look at the world this week. Um, um, and, and let the love of God and let God's change and God's spirit permeate your very being. Amen.